So our first speaker today is Alexandru, um, and he's going to talk to us about bioconductor helm charts. So go for it. Hello. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the bioconductor helm chart, uh, which is basically a, a packaged uh, pack for deploying bioconductor studio in Kubernetes, uh, and it's cloud agnostic, so it works on in theory any Kubernetes cluster, and it's been tested on a uh, a bunch of the cloud providers that I'll be listing later. So um, first, I just uh, want to give a little bit of background on containerization, Kubernetes, and what that is. So uh, I think containerization has become more and more popular in the past five or so years, especially in scientific uh, community. Uh, so one of the uh, so basically what containerization is is uh, getting a small container that has its own operating system, generally a Linux operating system, and then building all the entire stack that uh, an application or a, a software package needs to run to already uh, be in the container itself. Uh, so a container comes with all the dependencies that the software needs to run. Um, it is built in and immutable, so once it is packaged and put out there, uh, it, it just always comes with the same um, stack in it. Um, and one of the big things about it is that it shifts a lot more of the responsibility of making sure that um, everything works to the developer. Uh, so if the container was built properly, um, it worked when it was packaged. In theory, it should continue working forever because all the dependencies are there, even if there's upstream changes. Those upstream changes don't affect the container itself. Uh, so one of the big notable benefits of that is that one for the user, they don't have to actually understand a lot of the peculiarities of installing software, especially peculiarities that have to do with their own operating system. So whether you're on Windows, Linux, Mac, or anything else, you can just run a Docker singularity container, and in theory, it should done the same way because uh, it comes with its own Linux, built in Linux kernel inside. Um, and that is especially helpful for non-computational or less computational scientists that don't want to deal with you know, errors in compiling software or uh, pulling dependencies. Um, and for the developer themselves, it also gives them a little bit more leeway in how often they, can, they have to update the software. So um, in general, it is still good to update. Uh, dependencies generally get updated because of security flaws or other things, but um, it gives them more leeway. So if somebody changed something upstream in one of the dependencies, the package or the, the software that they're trying to publish doesn't immediately break because they need to update it immediately because the built-in dependency can stay the same. Um, so uh, in terms of Bioconductor, there's the Bioconductor Studio Docker container uh, mostly worked on by Nitesh uh, from the Bioconductor Core team. Um, it is built on the Docker Studio uh, Docker image. Um, and notably, it, on top of the Docker Studio, it has all the system dependencies that is needed for all Bioconductor packages. So whenever a package comes into Bioconductor, it is checked and built on the, this Docker image as well. And if there's any system level dependency that needs to be added, it is added with to kind of have the contract that any bioconductor package is can be readily installed and run on the Docker image without having to deal with any C or Linux or system dependencies. Um, and the Docker container is perfect for a single node or a local on your laptop deployment. So if you just want a very easy, simple a studio image that you can run any bioconductor uh, bio package in, it's a perfect solution for the one command and a one command uh, deployment that just gives you a running R studio instance. Now for um, a little bit more complicated setups, if you want a multi-node cluster, you want to scale up a little bit, Docker becomes a little bit less of a solution because you need orchestration between the nodes. You need orchestration between different microservices if you're running not just a studio, but are also talking to, for example, Redis or any other uh, service and application. So Kubernetes is kind of um, an emerging technology that uh, 
has won what was called the container wars or the orchestration wars. There are still other um, other solutions. I think Mesos is one of them. Um, OpenShift, uh, but Kubernetes has kind of become a, a de facto container orchestration technology. It is fully open source. It started uh, as an internal Google product, but it got open sourced and has been taken on by the Linux Foundation and specifically the Cloud Native Computing Foundation under the Linux Foundation. Um, and uh, what Kubernetes does is orchestrate a bunch of uh, containers, uh, Docker containers, or it's a container runtime engine essentially. So you can run uh, hundreds of small containers running on different nodes that talk to each other through Kubernetes. Um, uh, so a little bit less technical. So basically what, uh, Kubernetes does is it abstracts virtual machines as a cluster. So, um, in the traditional cloud computing, you would have a virtual machine that is your, uh, what you call a pet. Uh, if it goes down, all your services go down. It's a lot of maintenance and Kubernetes kind of takes that to the cattle. So instead of treating each node, each virtual machine as a separate entity, you talk to the cluster as a whole. If one node goes down because of hardware failure or whatever, Kubernetes will reschedule those pods on one of the healthy nodes on that cluster. So the language uh, that is used then is like that your virtual machines are not pets, they're cattle and that they're more disposable instead of having to take care of them individually, as long as your cluster is healthy, individual nodes can be unhealthy. Um, and beyond that, it gives a standardized layer. So um, across any cl cloud provider, and I've named here like the four big ones that I know, uh, so AWS, Azure, GCE, and uh, OpenStack, which is an open source uh, a cloud provider. Um, Kubernetes can give an abstraction layer that you can develop things to run on Kubernetes. And once you have the stack running on Kubernetes, you can move it between all the clouds and without or with, with very minimal changes. So it kind of uh, pushes that idea of develop once, have a working stack, deploy it wherever you want, move it between all of the clouds. Um, so a little bit more concretely, uh, so we have a Jetstream 2 allocation, um, which uses the OpenStack interface here. You can see there's the three nodes that are three individual nodes. Um, so instead of talking to them as individual nodes, putting them in a Kubernetes cluster, you see this is the entire cluster together. So, um, so you see here there's 64 cores. That is the total of the cores of the three machines together. The 241 gigs of memory is the total of all the machines together. So when you want to deploy a pod or a container in the cluster, you just tell Kubernetes, deploy this pod. The Kubernetes scheduler looks at the nodes. It deploys it to the best one that has the capacity that you asked for. So you don't have to look at the nodes individually anymore. You can just talk to the cluster and let the scheduler. And of course, you can assign to a specific node if you want to orchestrate very specifically to have nodes for specific things. You can give it affinities or restrictions to actually target a node, but in general, you don't have to. Um, uh, so then talking a little bit about Helm, uh, Helm comes as like a package manager for Kubernetes applications. Uh, so if you are familiar with the Python world, it's kind of similar to pip um, in, in that there's, uh, once you package an application, you can put it out there and then you can say Helm install this application and it has all the dependencies that it needs, all the resources and how they talk to each other just packaged in one single command. So some examples, if you want a MongoDB instance, Bitnami has a MongoDB chart, say Helm install Bitnami, MongoDB, and you have a MongoDB instance, you have the service, ingress, storage, everything packaged within that, same for Jupyter Hub. Um, for example, if you wanna uh, set up a network file system, the Kubernetes, uh, there's a uh, Kubernetes group that has an NFS server provisioner, and the chart that I'm gonna talk about, the Bioconductor Helm chart for our studio um, as well. So. Now, going specifically to Bioconductor Helm chart, uh, so a little bit of history on how this chart came to be. Um, originally, it was created as the R Studio Helm chart. Uh, so our studio themselves don't actually have a, they do have Helm charts, but only for the paid products. They don't have a public Helm chart for the community edition. 
Um, so it was originally developed as part of the genomics virtual lab and Cloudman projects uh, out of, uh, within the Galaxy group. Um, and when the GVL got the public GVL instance got deprecated, uh, it kind of got adopted by Bioconductor. Um, and now it's mostly maintained by me and Nuan Gunasikara from uh, Galaxy Australia. Uh, we mostly maintain it for now Bioconductor, but also um, internal things that are still using it within institutions that we work with. Um, so theoretically, this Helm chart can be deployed on any Kubernetes cluster. Um, if you go to the source code on GitHub, you will see uh, instructions and examples to deploy on a local Minikube cluster. Minikube is uh, a way to get a Kubernetes cluster on your local computer. You can deploy it on Azure AKS, which is the managed Kubernetes service, Google Kubernetes engine, or the Elastic Kubernetes service on AWS. All of these have been tested, and it's essentially a single command deployment. Um, talking a little bit about what the chart includes. So the main component of the chart is the RStudio deployment resource. Uh, so that is where the uh, Bioconductor Docker image is. That's the pod that is actually the RStudio pod. Um, then there's a config map, which is uh, basically a text file that has um, all the configurations for RStudio that is attached to that deployment. Um, there is the persistent volume claim. Uh, so uh, in Kubernetes world, you have a claim for how much storage you want, and you ask a storage class, which is generally provided by the Kubernetes engine, to just fulfill that claim for you. So you say, I want a 50 gig volume to be attached at this path, and the storage class within that Kubernetes engine just fulfills that for you. So that's what the persistent volume claim would do. Um, and then there's a service, which is the middle layer between the pod itself and the studio deployment and the Kubernetes network. So instead of referring to the pod directly and to the port directly, the service abstract that. So there's uh, in the Kubernetes internal network, there's just the local DNS that is a studio service. And that itself points at the pod. This is specifically relevant, for example, if you uh, have an application that can run, um, that can scale. So if you want to load balance between multiple pods, uh, the service would be the single entry point, and then it would point to multiple pods, so it would load balance the traffic. Um, there's the ingress, which exposes the service. Uh, so uh, this can be an Nginx, an Apache, uh, whatever uh, ingress controller you want to use. Uh, this exposes the service usually to the outside world. And then finally, the service account, which deals with uh, authentication and uh, identity management within Kubernetes. Um, so this, this is kind of all the resources, the Kubernetes manifests that are part of the chart. So when you do Helm install, Bioconductor Helm, <coughs> these are the resources that are actually being deployed within your Kubernetes cluster. Um, so as a very quick example, as on what this, and you can see for all the clouds in the in the GitHub repo, but this is the example for AKS on how easy it is to deploy it. You just launch the cluster, which is AZ AKS create, or if you already have a cluster, you just uh, use the get credentials command to point the cube configuration to that. And then you just say Helm install Bioconductor Helm. Uh, there is an example folders in the repository that has example working values for each cloud. And just to actually show what that is, it's not complicated at all. It's um, just uh, the few peculiarities for each Kubernetes engine. So for example, the biggest thing for AKS is that they call the storage class default, as opposed to Amazon calls the storage class GP2, I believe. Uh, so these are the small things that you have to change between the things, but between the different clouds. But uh, and once you point to the storage class that comes with the Kubernetes engine, it just fulfills the persistent volume claim for you. Um, the service type load balancer makes you not have to uh, do an ingress yourself. So that's why you can disable the ingress. And once when you say load balancer, uh, AKS or any of the other clouds will give you an IP address automatically. Um, port 80 just to, so that you don't actually have to put a port, that's the default HTTP port. 
and then you can add the environment variable to a studio password to set a password for your server. Box, you're running a little long. Okay, sorry. Uh, can you uh, wrap yeah. it up? Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you can do a lot more parameterization. Technically, this is compatible with any Docker Studio Docker image. You can change the tag for the Bioconductor Dockers, but you can also use like the machine learning Docker Studio image, for example. Um, yeah, you can change what storage you want. So you can use the network file system, Azure Files, um, Amazon EFS, file store on Google. Um, we added a feature for persisting the our libraries. So between sessions, you can keep a volume with your libraries, tear it all down, and then bring it back up and keep what you have installed in your environment. Um, going forward, there's a few ideas of the things that we want to add. Um, Specifically, if you went to Natasha's workshop, we're going to try to add a lot of the Redis and parallel computing dependencies to this chart so that it can be a full stack together. Um, some more ideas for later that take a little bit longer, which we're not going to go through. Um, and yeah, if anybody has any ideas or particular features of interest or use cases that they want to do, feel free to contact me on email, Slack, or just in GitHub issues and propose whatever you think would be useful. Um, so this is relatively new and looking for uh, real users and uh, trying to be useful for specific use cases. That is it. Okay. So there's a question for you in the chat. Um, is there an R package to help deploy Kubernetes or is there a plan to enable BioC Parallel to work with Kubernetes? Uh, yes, uh, so part of... Uh, this one of the idea is to make QPRAM, which would be a BIOC parallel uh, package to talk to the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, a prerequisite for that is to make an actual R Kubernetes client to be able to talk to the Kubernetes API more generally from within R. And that's a plan for a pet project that I picked up. Um, that's a cool plan. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't see any other, does anyone have a question in the room? Yeah. Could you elaborate a little bit on the volume that is uh, added to your cluster? Is it like a NFS or is it Docker volume? Yeah, yeah so a uh, volume is parameterizable. So here you um, you can use a network file system if you want. For example, I usually use the Kubernetes uh, SIGs chart to have, a, have an NFS server when it's multi-node. You can use a local host volume. So if you're just running on a single node, you just tell it, just use the node of the volume. Uh, if you're running in any of the clouds, so for example, um, Azure, oh, where was it? Um, here, when I said storage class default, that's the default storage class within the Azure community service that will create a volume for you. So once the claim comes in, it tells the storage class, I want a 10 gig disk or a 100 gig disk. It will automatically attach it to the node that is running the pod and automatically mount it for you. And for example, if that node goes down and Kubernetes moved the, the pod from that node to another one on the cluster, it will automatically also unmount that volume from the node that went down, remount it on the new node, and reattach it. So it's pretty automatic. The Kubernetes scheduler does a lot of the work for you. All you have to do is know what storage class you have within. And it's uh, all the nodes have access to the same uh, folder or the same storage. If you storage use access. if you use a network file system, whether it's one that you deploy or Azure files, um, file store on Google or EFS on AWS, those are managed network file systems that they provide. But yeah, in that case, you all the nodes have access like to it. Oh, uh, in a lead like one scenario, if you use the default storage oh, class, it just attaches to the one node that's running the pod. And it does yeah. automatically really attach it to the node you if the pod is moved, but in that case, what? it's only that node. So you do need a network file system or a set of so if you want to. I'll get you water. Okay. We're going to run into a real time crunch. I think. Yes, we are, we are. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> What's everybody going? Is it okay? <laughs>